In this video, I will be going through the working memory model as part of the memory topic for the AQA specification, uh, and this was developed by Badley and Hitch. Um, first off, let's start by looking at what you need to know according to the AQA specification. So it says there you need to know about the working memory model, you need to know about the different components, which I'll take you through, so it's the central executive, the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketch pad, and the episodic buffer. Uh, you need to know a little bit about each of these uh, separate systems, and you need to know a little bit about their capacity. Uh, if you've already looked at the multi-store model, this will really help because some of the terms that we use, some of the, the researchers as you'll see and some of the, the case studies are, are quite similar. Um, so without further ado, let's look at the working memory model. Um, so the working memory model was developed as Badley and Hitch said that the multi-store model um, didn't do a few things and, and they wanted to add to it. Basically the working memory model is a um, more detail into short-term memory. So whereas the multi-store model looked at all of memory, how we take information in, how we store it for a short amount of time, how we store it for a long amount of time, the working memory model is just focusing on short-term memory. Um, but it goes over and above that. Um, the questions that Badley and Hitch asked were what is the use of short-term memory, um, what kind of tasks are carried out there. Um, and this is the sort of thing where if you were told a mobile phone number, um, you'd need to remember it. This was the days before mobile telephones and now I'm really showing my age because I do remember those times, bad times. Um, it's also where you would work out maths problems. That's maybe a bit more relatable to you. So if I asked you to calculate a fairly simple sum, um, two plus two equals four, quick math, um, or 13 plus 18 plus 24, um, what you would do is you'd use your working memory model. So you might break down the uh, equation, you might look at 13 plus 18 first uh, and figure that's 31 and then you'd add the 24 to that uh, and that's 55. So what Badley and Hitch are saying is that memory isn't just static as may be suggested in the multi-store model. It doesn't just pass through passively through three different stores. There is active processing and that's the key part there. So working memory is talking about processing and storage in short-term memory. So this was the model they came up with uh, and as already was hinted on the specification, there are five separate uh, systems that you need to be aware about. So there's the central executive there at the top um, and then that's uh, known as a controlling system. We'll go into a bit more detail about that. You've then got the slave systems known as the phonological loop um, and within that you get the phonological store and the articulatory process. Uh, this is sometimes called the inner voice and you've got the visual spatial sketch pad on the other side uh, and you've got the visual cache and the inner scribe uh, sometimes known as the inner eye and then there's the episodic buffer um, and that then goes down onto long-term memory but as i said the, the main components are the four that make up the working memory model um, because it is short-term memory long-term is just the, the fifth store where the information would pass to uh, so without further ado let's look at each of these different components and what they do in a bit more detail so let's start with the central executive. The central executive is seen as being at the top of the model uh, and it's known as being the attentional system. So it's the thing that directs attention uh, to other resources, the other systems, and, and we'll talk a bit about that. So it's to do with decision making, um, the information that comes into the system, obviously via the senses from, from the central register. Remember the, the working memory model is a, a model of short-term memory, um, it allocates the resources to, to the other stores um, based on what the information is. And as we'll see when we look at the other stores, if it's visual information, it will go to one place. If it's um, auditory information, it will go to another. Um, what that means is the central executive is known as being modality free. What that means is it can take information in from any of our senses. Um, the other stores are different to this. The other stores can obviously only take in information that are specific to that store, to, to the coding process. But the central executive, the fact that it's modality free, that term means that it can take in information visually or auditory, etc. It's known as having a limited capacity. As it's attention, it's seen as an attentional system, it's, it can only, the capacity is only for what you're paying attention to at, at the time. Um, and 
the what you can pay attention to again will, will differ and when we look at the other stores that will make sense the other stores or the other systems um, are known as the slave systems so I like to use the analogy of the apprentice so Lord Sugar uh, is the central executive he's the one that's sending out the task uh, allocating attention to his slave systems and then the slave systems would be uh, Karen Brady or Claude Littner so he, his aides basically they are the the slave systems um, and the slave systems are independent of each other and again this comes up a bit later on. So moving on to one of these slave systems, the phonological loop, that deals with auditory information. So anything that is acoustically coded, and we covered that in the multi-store model, so anything to do with sound, uh, that goes into one of these other subsystems, the slave systems, the phonological loop. Um, and it's said that the phonological loop itself is divided into two separate areas. The first is the phonological store, and the phonological store stores sounds, stores words that we hear. The other side of it is known as the articulatory process, and this is where we repeat things to ourselves in our heads. It's known as maintenance rehearsal, and again, that term came up in the multi store model. So it's where we can, if you meet someone for the first time, they tell you their name, you might repeat to yourself, oh, this is Sally, or, or whoever it may be. Um, and this is where, again, um, talking about um, what you say, what you hear, uh, this would be where you speak to yourself in your head, I know you do it. Uh, so we all do it, we all say things to ourselves, um, and this is what the articulatory process does. So the phonological loop is all to do with auditory information, acoustic encoding, and it's split into the phonological store, which stores the words we hear, and the articulatory process, which repeats words to us in our head, um, and, it, and it's all to do with sound. It's said that there's about a two second loop, again that comes up a bit later on when we look at the evaluation. The other slave store is known as the Visio Spatial Sketchpad, uh, and as you can imagine, this is to do with visual and spatial information. So we've got the central executive, which is at the top, and it's allocating attention either to the phonological loop on the one hand, or this Visio Spatial Sketchpad. So this is where we pick up, uh, we, we notice things in the environment, we see things, we, we see someone's face, um, uh, so that's the visual side of things, but also spatial. What I mean by spatial is it almost creates a map in our head. So if I were to ask you to close your eyes, uh, imagine walking through your front door at home um, and you go into the front room that's there, you should be able to do that and you should quite vividly imagine a, an image of your house. Um, that's the spatial side because you're, you're, it's almost creating a, uh, a map in your mind. Um, so that's a visual spatial sketchpad. You, would, you need this, you need this to, to walk anywhere if you you walk from your house to your local shops, you can probably do that without consciously thinking about it because of your visual spatial sketch. Right? You've got this spatial, this map programmed in that, that you know where to go. If you're playing Call of Duty you and you learn a new map, again, you're using your spatial awareness. Um, and that's... Uh, quite important as well. There is a limited capacity here, um, obviously it's you can only visualise and see a certain amount, again it's what, it's what you're paying attention to. Much like the phonological loop, Logie has said that the visual spatial sketchpad is separated into two kind of subdivisions, two smaller areas, and these are the visual cache, and this is where, or cache, this is where they, we store visual information, so um, in the phonological loop it's the um, phonological store here, it's the visual cache, this is where you store visual information. And then you've got the inner scribe, and this is where we're talking about spatial information, again, where objects are. So, you know, if you're, if you're walking uh, through a room and you want to walk around the chair and not walk into it, you're going to need to use your inner scribe to kind of map that room and map what, what moves to make. Again, if you're playing sports, uh, especially team sport, if you're making a pass in rugby or in football, you're going to need your inner scribe to create a map, to create a vision of, right, what, where's this pass going to go? Where are my, my teammates going? Um, so that those are the, the key um, systems. The next store is the episodic buffer, and this was actually added a bit later to the model um, based on some criticism that the model had. So we've got the central executive, you've got the phonological loop, the visual spatial sketchpad. Obviously, phonological loop dealing with auditory information, visual spatial, visual and spatial information. The criticism was that, well, where are these... Um, how how and where are these stores 
overlapping? What if you've got visual and spatial information? How do we hold that together? Is there a timestamp on it? So almost like episodic, I don't know why it's called the episodic buffer. Uh, the episodes, episodic memory, as mentioned in the multi-store model. Um, you know, when and where have we seen information before? Um, and as well as that, because this is a model of short-term memory, the criticism was, well, then what happens to it? Where, what, how, how does the information go from being in the phonological loop and visual spatial sketchpad going into the long-term memory? So in the year 2000, Badly added this model, this system. Um, and so the episodic buffer, that's its purpose. It's to gather information in from the other two stores. So it's aware of the other two stores kind of communicating. Um, it adds some sort of timestamp to it, hence the episode side of it. And it's the link to the long-term memory. Um, and so it's a store that brings everything else together. So pretty much everything else links back to the uh, episodic buffer. And then just to remind you then, this is what the model looks like. Now we've gone through them all in a bit more detail. So you've got the central executive there at the top, which uh, attributes attention to either the phonological loop or the visual spatial sketchpad. You've got the uh, episodic buffer. Information can come um, from the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketchpad into the episodic buffer. Maybe I should have added uh, arrows there. And then from the episodic buffer, information can go uh, to the long term memory. Okay, and now since you've already looked at the model, let's look at some evaluation. Um, and some of the best evaluative points come from research support, and there is lots of it, which is great. It adds some real weight behind the model. So first we have KF, and KF is a case study um, presented by Shalice and Warrington. And KF had brain damage. Um, and what happened with KF is um, he could recall information if it was presented to him visually, but if it was verbal, he, that was very poor for him. So for example, if you um, said the letter P to him and asked him to recall what letter you've just said, that might be very difficult for him to do and he wouldn't be able to do that. However, if you were to write the letter P down, present it to him, take it away and then ask him to recall it, he might be a bit better at doing that. Uh, so that's a uh, supply some evidence, some support for the fact that there are these two different stores in our short-term memory. One is processing what we see and one is processing what we hear. If that wasn't the case, you would expect KF to be able to do both of those. But the fact that he can do one but can't do the other suggests that we're processing them in different ways. So that adds some support to the model, the fact that the, the phonological loop and visual space your sketchpad one exists and two that they are separate stores. One caveat to this uh, is the fact that obviously this is a case study done with a guy with uh, brain damage. Are those results generalizable to the rest of the population? I would argue not. C can we say that this is how normal memory works? Well, probably not as this case was obviously uh, with someone who, who had a brain damage. There is, however, other research support, which is good. So there's something called dual task performance. And what we mean by dual task is if we ask people to do one task, or, or sorry, if we ask people to do two tasks that require one of the slave systems. Uh, and what you find is if you do that, people are quite poor. Whereas if you ask people to do two tasks and one requires one of the systems, the phonological loop, for example, and one requires the other, the visual spatial sketchpad, people can do that quite well. Uh, so this was tested by Badly et al. Um, Badly asked people to track a light, so a light might have been shined on a wall, shined on a wall uh, and then describe the letter F without seeing it. So to describe the letter F, you have to construct that letter in your mind. So both of those are visual spatial tasks. Um, and what, they, what Badly et al. found was that people were fairly poor at doing that. Uh, the idea being that because your visual spatial sketchpad was taken up by one of the tasks following the light, the second one was more difficult to do. When uh, they asked people to track the light and then listen to some music, what they found was people could do that. They could recall um, movements of the light and the music. Um, and so what that means is that these two separate tasks visual and uh, auditory are being processed in different areas uh, and again that adds support to the model think without any of this research this is just a theory this is just uh, an idea that we have these different stores the fact that there is this research to back it up says no it's not just what we think's happening look we, we've got some evidence that these are, are, are happening as well there's other research as well um, looking into specifically the phonological loop badly et al 
Yeah, again, so if you ever stuck for research in the memory topic, just say it was badly and you'll probably be about right. Uh, badly et al, um, they conducted another study um, and this one it was on something called the word length effect. And what you find here is that people can remember as much as it takes to say in two seconds. Okay, so if that's lots of little words, it is and can or, that might be two seconds, um, or supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, that's one word. Okay, so the, the key is, it's whatever you can hear um, in two seconds. That suggests two things. One, that we are paying attention to, to what we hear and what the words sound like. Uh, and two, that there is a, a limited capacity, probably um, two seconds or maybe it's just a duration, but um, a limited store, the, the phonological loop is limited. Uh, and it backs up the idea that we are listening to the sounds and so therefore backs up the idea that the phonological loop is a thing. Another bit of research, thank God, from a different researcher, Breva et al. Uh, and this one backs up the idea that the central executive um, exists uh, and has a part to play in working memory. So what happened here is they um, asked people to complete tasks that would require their central executive, so attentional tasks, for example. <clears throat> And they asked them to do this while they were having brain scans. Um, and what they found is as the task um, complexity increased, so as they had to pay more and more attention, they found more and more activation uh, in brain regions. Uh, so this supports the idea that the central executive uh, it has its own area within the brain. It suggests that it is a separate, unique thing, uh, different to, to the other tasks. Um, and so backs that up and backs up the, the central executive is involved in attention. There, it's not a perfect model, however, and actually the main criticism of the model probably does come from the central executive itself. So badly, oh, bloody badly, uh, badly again said that the most important but the least understood component of the working memory model is the central executive. So the, the weakness here is that the central executive, okay, we think it exists, Attention is a really, really important thing, and without it, you haven't got the other two stores. We really need to know a lot about it, but actually, we don't. Just saying it's attention is quite broad. And there is actually some research um, that suggests that there are different types of central executive, or there are different areas of the central executive. There might be one involved in, in starting doing a task, another involved in stopping doing a task. It, it's actually a really complex thing, but all we know about it at the moment is its attention. And so that's uh, a bit of an issue. So that should give you enough evaluative points um, to be able to, to construct a fairly coherent essay, hopefully. So um, I hope that you, you are able to do that and give that a go, and it doesn't go too badly. Get it? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening, and I hope to complete uh, some of my other memory videos shortly.